Marketers have found a 760% increase in email revenue from segmented campaigns. Give readers what they need and what they didn't know they need. Welcome to Email Einstein, a podcast by Floium. It's time to start honing your inner marketing Einstein. Tune in for the data-driven tips that'll make you a marketing genius. Here you'll find email marketing formulas and tips straight from the brilliant mad scientists at Floium. It's time for your emails to start earning more money. It's time to unleash your Einstein. Hey everyone, and welcome back to Email Einstein. Vera and Elisa here. We are two email marketers at an email marketing agency called Floium. We are so passionate about email marketing and because we love what we do, we wanna share our insights with you. Floium is one of the fastest growing email marketing agencies in the world. We specialize in providing a premium, full service e-commerce email marketing experience for all of our clients. Our service is tailored specifically for your business and is designed to help increase increase your online retail revenue by 20 to 50%. We deliver the right message to the right person at the right moment and that is what we are all about. And we are feeling good about today's episode. So Vera, take it away. <laughs> oh yes, we do feel good about this episode today. <laughs> One of our favorite topics to talk about, newsletters. So um, it's a good tradition, I guess, to start our podcast with like nerdy numbers or something. So let's do it again. <laughs> Alice, I think we should have some kind of like a track or music, like nerdy numbers, <laughs> something like that, you know, because we always, always use them. Well, anyways, so let's play this little game. How much time do you think the average person spend in their inbox, like at work? Uh, quick note, if the person does not work in the email marketing, because obviously in this case, you, you spend your entire time in your yeah. inbox. But like <laughs> an, average, an average office worker, how much time do you think Gosh, spend in their inbox? I would say probably an hour every morning. So if someone's working five days a week, I'd say like five hours maybe like maybe 10 but i'd say closer to like five to like eight hours would be my well, guess that's what i thought actually that's what i thought but turned out that the average like u.s employee spends around like 13 of their working hours in their inbox and wow. this is just like we are talking just about the working hours not and your work work email basically and i mean it's a good it's a good news for us as an email marketing yeah. uh, email marketers but at the same time it's like a bad news because uh, you can imagine the amount of the information that people are getting through the emails and because people are spending so much time in their emails you can really make a great impact or a bad one <laughs> yeah so here's another mind-blowing number an average person gets approximately 121 emails per day can you imagine wow. like that's that's insane and I like I'm talking like all kinds of emails promotional emails your Facebook notification emails from your grandma and stuff like that so that's a lot <laughs> of emails if you ask me and if you really want to break through this like a ton of email clutter that your customer is receiving every day you should get really really creative and mm -hmm. high quality newsletter is actually one of the best way to ensure that your emails are the brightest emails in your customers inbox yeah and for sure good quality newsletter that's ex actually what we will be talking about in today's podcast and having seen like a ton of good newsletters uh we'd love to share our little like secrets or a short list of recommendations and how to's for creating the your very own and very best newsletter so stay tuned I love to say this, like, stay tuned if you're like a YouTuber or something. <laughs> yeah, but before we go there, Alyssa, what's the email marketing pro tip for the week? So our pro tip for the week is subscribe to your competitors' newsletters. Which I think people who or brands that are in the same industry are like, wait, what? You want me to what? You what? Like, because the thing is, is and I was actually when I was like looking into this a little further, there was a, a Reddit post or something or like a Quora post where someone was asking a question on a forum and they were saying, how should I allow my competitors to subscribe to my newsletter list? And people were like getting really nasty in the comments like, no, don't do it. You should create a spoof site and make your competitors sign up there. So they're getting false information. Da, 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 da. Mm. <laughs> yeah, which I, I read and I was like, well. I don't really love that. We are all about competition here at Floium and we love mm -hmm. 
being able to share what we do with our competitors so our competitors can either try and do it better than us but we also want to know what our competitors are doing too so that way we can you know stay kind of up to date in the industry and and be able to provide the best service for our clients and it should be the same across all e-commerce brands so the reason why we suggest for you to subscribe to your competitors newsletters is to see what they're doing what is it that they're offering what is it that they're providing information wise what is it that's that they're doing that's so successful about their brand it's not going to always reflect a hundred percent back to your own brand brand because you have a different mission, you have a different vision, you have different values. Mm -hmm. So the subscribing to your competitors newsletters is a great idea because essentially what it does is it gives you insight into what they're doing and will hopefully help be the catalyst for you to start brainstorming about what you should be doing for your own subscribers and your own audience. So it's something that we do across the board. Whenever we have a new client, we subscribe to all of their competitors so that we can see what they're doing and just do it better <laughs> essentially yeah, yeah, so you know, they say they say good artist copy great artist steal so exactly <laughs> i think that's i think <laughs> that's actually the good good approach like learn <laughs> learn from your competitors exactly like play with open cards and do you even have this like phrase in english playing with open cards because we have it like in ukrainian oh um it's, like, it means that you're like very transparent with everything that you're doing Yeah, I, I don't know what exactly the phrase is in English. I think it's uh, when you lay your cards on the table so oh, that yeah, everyone yeah. can see what you're doing. Or like, well, anyway, like, something about the cards. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> cool. Well, I think I think it's actually a great, great pro tip of the week. So guys, go ahead and subscribe to your uh, competitors' newsletters and to your competitors' emails. And let's let's go to the topic of our week. So like what makes good newsletters good newsletters? So when I say newsletter, actually, like what words come to your mind? Like when I think about it, when I thought about it before I came into the industry, like associations that I had was like impersonal, formal, boring. And unfortunately for many people, these are the first words that come to mind when they mm -hmm. think about newsletters. Because historically, newsletters have been this like formal letters or formal prints or emails that like brag about internal achievements of the company or like some snooze worthy news and like legal mumbo jumbo, you know? So I believe that like a lot of people have the same, like the same thinking about the emails and we believe that no one wants to have like this kind of mm, newsletters in their sure. inbox like i don't you Alyssa, probably yeah, don't no, no, no. To have them either and probably even like your grandma is only glancing at your <laughs> memorial news day newsletter because she loves you but <laughs> but when emails are written with like your own philosophy with your own like insights, unique thoughts about the industry or about what is happening in the world, about what is interesting to your specific customer. So that's like the entirely different story. And these are actually the kind of newsletters that we will be talking about. So here are the five or six, I don't remember, <laughs> essential <laughs> tips for writing good email newsletters. So Alyssa, what's the first ingredient of a successful newsletter? So our first is to start with your goal for your newsletter in mind. So typically a newsletter is used to widen a brand's reach. Essentially what it's supposed to do is it's supposed to allow your audience to reach a sense of enlightenment about what your brand is like really all about, what they represent, but then also educate them as well about what's going on internally, any other insights that you can provide, if you can relieve any pain points or add any value to their life, their lives, and also include updates, promotions, etc. Things like that. Newsletters aren't always promotional. And actually, I think Avira and I would agree with this is that you should probably steer away from including promotional aspects mm -hmm. to your newsletter where you're trying to sell. Again, like I'd mentioned in the first point, you're, you're trying to educate and provide insight for your audience that's going to um, build credibility with your brand, but then also kind of show that you're the leader in this industry. So for example, if you sell, gosh, water bottles, 
bottles. I'm looking at my water bottle at my desk and you send out a newsletter. Your newsletter isn't going to just cover, oh, well, buy my water bottle. This is why my water bottle is so great. Maybe you'll do a water bottle review across the industry of different kinds of water bottles and the different things that they provide, the different benefits that they have. Then you'll also talk about really great water filters for the water that you're going to put in your water bottle, different features that different kinds of water bottles include, like things like that. You want to kind of expand mm-hmm. what you're talking about and not just talk about your own brand and your own product because it just, again, it's snoozeworthy, you know, like no one cares. You have other emails to talk about your product and those are typically found in your automations, your newsletter is really to uh, make a connection with your people, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, there's only that much you can say about the water bottle. Yeah, yeah, the wa- water bottle. Products, so. The water bottle maybe wasn't the best. <laughs> the best. No, no, it was a good one actually. It was a good one. <laughs> but you know, like that kind of thing where you want to give more than just talking about your product. So typically, what brands do is they gather their email list through subscriptions. So whether it's like an opt-in, pop-up or your footer subscriber um, on your webpage or whatever it is. So when readers subscribe, they're typically getting these scheduled emails. And when they get these scheduled newsletter emails, they already signed up for them. So it works well because you're now just providing the information that they kind of opted in to get. And it also makes it easier for your brand and specifically to the marketers of your brand to build relationships and start conversations with your subscribers. So basically what the newsletter does is it's able to facilitate the transparency and the openness that you have with your subscribers. So now you're creating kind of this environment of trust, but also establishing a level of authority with your audience, which is huge. They, You want your audience to trust that you are the leader in the industry and you know exactly what you're talking about. Newsletters are also really great ways for brands to get involved in what's being discussed with your demographic that you're trying to sell to. And Fear will get into this later in the episode, but there are different types of content that you can now start including into your newsletters that are going to be of interest to your subscribers. And And typically, this information that you're including is vital. It's going to highlight shifts in the organizational structure that's going on for you guys. So if your brand has hired a new kind of key role and you want your subscribers to get to know who this person is, then that person now has the opportunity to write a newsletter. Hey, this is who I am. These are the things that are important. And this is what we want to share with you guys, that kind of thing. So again, we're now getting through the tips of what to do. But um, what you want to do in order to make the biggest impact with your newsletters is send a newsletter out at least once a month, preferably once a week. Mm -hmm. But if you're going to kind of keep it minimal because you don't want to go crazy, you send it out once a month. And they're very important. Uh, Your subscribers want to hear from you. There's a reason why they subscribe to your brand. And so they want to hear from you and they want to hear what you have to say. So you have one newsletter shot, make it count because it's really, really important. So that's number one is making sure that you have a goal in mind for what you're trying to achieve through your newsletter but Vera hit us with number two yeah so number two Number two is a big one, actually. Yeah. So number two is give readers what they need and give them what they didn't know they need. (laughs) So um, basically, let's use uh, Alyssa's example with the water bottle. So as we mentioned, there's only that much things that you can say about the water bottle if your company is selling the bottles. But probably your customers would also be interested to know more about the water, about the like how to how to clean their water or how much water they need to drink uh, per day or mm-hmm. the cities like top 10 cities with the best water quality in the world or whatever so <laughs> yeah like one of the best steps to an excellent newsletter is actually to stop thinking of your of this email as a newsletter and start thinking of it as your outlet where you can actually share your unique perspective and thoughts on the business or on the product that you are selling this is the outlet where you can actually build the relationship just like Alyssa mentioned build the relationship with your customers strengthen your brand and like promote your community even if you have like a Facebook group for uh, water lovers or like I don't know whatever so you can promote your Facebook community or your uh, blog content or your Instagram or stuff like that so like what content to share so here are a few like great examples of what we've done in the past and what we've seen our competitors did because we are subscribed to our competitors 
years. <laughs> um, so creating an email uh, newsletter free of grammatical errors and broken links is like important, but providing actionable, helpful information to your subscribers is even more important. So mm. the low hanging fruit, the probably the easiest the thing that you can do is to share your blog post because I know that a lot of businesses are doing blog posts and like uh, Facebook posts and stuff like that. So good for you guys. Um, you are moving in the right direction. <laughs> um, SEO is really important. So if you're already like regularly posting on your blog, be sure to share each of your posts in the newsletter. So remember to like encourage your subscribers to share maybe this post on their social media. Um, so you can even like include this little share button in your blog. So mm -hmm. all they have to do is just like you click one little button and it will be automatically shared to their Facebook or their LinkedIn or whatever. And there are like a gazillion free apps that can do that. So you can, you can do that. Okay. So top 10 list. This is my personal favorite. I'm like a sucker for this like, top 10 <laughs> list. So sometimes people come up with like really cool ways to use the products or like the tools that you give them. So you can do like what we've done. So we've created this like list, like 10 things to do while in quarantine this weekend. So we've sent it and it was our hit, you know, like we Googled like the best random top things to do. Or like you can also share some content about the unexpected ways to use your product. So something that we've done for one of our skincare uh, clients. So uh, they are basically selling this like creams and serums and stuff like that. And we've sent the newsletter with three ways to recycle like makeup containers or like skincare containers. Oh, cool. You I can, like that make, a lot. You can make a base. You can like reuse it as a storage or something like that. You can cut it or you can paint something on it. So stuff like that, you would be surprised, but that uh, these emails, they pop up in your newsletter because mm. you are not asking your customer to do something. You're just like giving them the value. I don't know, Alyssa, if you played this game when you were little, uh, but I remember in the in the camp, we played this game. So like come up with like 61 things you can do with an old mismatched sock. Oh my <laughs> you know gosh. Game? Yeah, yeah, and we, and we created this like list. <laughs> it's such a good game. I mean, I loved it. So we created like this list. Oh, you can use it as a sleeping bag for your hamster <laughs> or, <laughs> or you can do like this awesome stuff. So, I mean, it's, it's a fun little thing. Maybe like come up with the 61 things you can do with your water bottle or whatever. So a hamster. this, awesome. this, I know, right? So cute. <laughs> I still, I'm still laughing every time. That was not my idea, by the way. I was not like that creative when I was growing up. Yeah. So putting a human face on your business is a big one. And probably Alyssa, you know about it because I know you've done it with like some of your clients. If say if your client has a client or has a customer with like a cool story that they mm -hmm. can share. So you can like put a human face on your business and make it all real. So customer stories, like I know that you are doing it. Oh, actually, can you, can you share what you've done for one of your clients? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Just recently it's, uh, it's amazing. I, I love what you guys did. So, and I think I've mentioned this in the past because we've talked about utilizing user generated content in mm -hmm. one of our previous podcast episodes. I'll have to remember which one it was. But um, so the brand that I'm doing it for is Lulalu. And so they sell um, bras for women, but it's typically bras for uh, smaller chested women. And so one of the things that we are actually going to be doing for October because it's Breast Cancer Awareness Month is we are actually requesting that women send in their stories about their breast cancer survival if they're Lulalu customers and kind of how their experience with Lulalu has uh, positively impacted if they've had to have a, a, a breast removal surgery or anything like that. So aside from the breast cancer awareness thing, which is kind of like a pending project, one of the really cool things for us is um, seeing these stories of these women who were either made fun of when they were younger or they had issues or whatever it was and how finding a brand like Lulalu made them extremely happy, you know, like it made them feel more feminine and you get this really positive customer feedback. And I was actually talking to the client that we work with 
Um, and he was saying, you know, like owning a business is not easy, especially an e-commerce business. When you get customer feedback like that, it just makes everything completely worth it, you know, knowing that you've had some form of an impact in someone's life and whether it's not as kind of extreme as, hey, you made me get through my <laughs> breast cancer survival story, you know, even if it's not something like that, where it's something kind of not lesser, but not something as impactful in the sense of like, hey, you know, like your eyelash serum gave me so much more confidence to feel like me and go out, etc. So these customer stories are really touching. And sometimes we create these newsletters just purely for the sake of having customer engagement and customer feedback, because it's important for not only to kind of maintain the morale of your audience, but also it's important for you as a business owner to receive these kinds of things and see like, okay, it's worth it. I'm going to keep going. <laughs> I'm going to set up shop mm-hmm. and I'm going to keep running this business, you know? So Lulalu is uh, one of my favorite, favorite, favorite clients to work with. We've had a, a pretty long-standing relationship and it's just so cool to see everything that they're doing for their customers and how they're having such a positive impact on the community. So it's nice to be part of that, albeit a very small part of it, but it's nice to be part of that through email. So it's cool. And it's definitely something that if you're able to as an e-commerce business owner, definitely something that I think we would all encourage for you to really try and aim for because it's uh, it's very re- rewarding on all aspects. I agree. I agree. Actually, um, they have this really cool feature in Clavio where you can see, I think they have this feature in most email marketing platforms where you can actually see where people are clicking in your emails. You can mm-hmm. see like what, what links they click and, and stuff like that. And um, I work with this another um, client of mine and they have this really like big and successful um, supplement brand. So um, they are usually like selling some supplements for people in their like 50s and 60s and stuff like that. So uh, we are sending this newsletter called Progressive Thursday uh, because the brand name is uh, Progressive NutraCare. So we are sending this newsletter every two weeks bi-weekly progressive Thursday and I see every time I'm like reviewing the statistic I see that people click on those like slice of life stories Mm. the most so this is where all of our click-through rates basically are coming from we Mm -hmm. have this little section of the email called uh, progressive success corner where we are actually sharing uh, customer stories so like how they how they could overcome like a health condition with like a certain with like a certain supplement or how this brand helped them to live like a fuller and healthier life and stuff like that and I was actually surprised when I first started like looking at those numbers this like slice of life life story they do work and um yeah, so definitely reuse them in your newsletter, <laughs> reuse them in your um, in your flows, in your other campaigns. And if you want to hear more about it, we have actually this entire episode about three exciting email marketing trends we've seen in 2020. And actually in that episode, we talk a lot about like sharing customer story and sharing user generated content. So mm-hmm. go back and listen to that one because that is one of my favorite episodes actually. <laughs> so Yeah, me too. I, I might be biased because <laughs> I I've recorded it, uh, but uh, yeah, it's a good one. So go back and listen. Now, the next one, the next like a secret ingredient of a good newsletter is kind of a big one. And they say an email that reads well will be well read. So Alyssa, bring mm-hmm. on the third ingredient of a perfect newsletter. I love that saying an email that reads well will be read well or well read. That's really cool. I found really, it really somewhere cool. on the internet. I didn't come up <laughs> with this one, but I like it too. It's the same as the hamster. Hamster sleeping bag is like, I just can't get over that. It's so funny. You know, right? <laughs> Maybe that should be our new uh, e-commerce gig, Alyssa. Like, who needs podcasts? Podcasts are so like 2000s, right? <laughs> Just make make an e-commerce business for a hamster sleeping bag. Well, that it's is a niche. The riches are in the niches, right? That, that is true. That is very true. So our third special ingredient for a perfect newsletter is great copy and even better design. So we'll actually be talking about this in next week's episode specifically with copy, but I'll kind of run through a list of like sort of like um, kind of like a checklist for both and kind of share a little more information and summarize what I mean by it. But um, we will eventually get into copy in future episodes and then also design in future episodes because we are email marketers, but we are definitely not the copywriters or the designers when it comes to the emails. There are some experts that we we love to work with and that we prefer to work with. So we will be referencing them in future episodes. But all right. So for copy, things that you want to focus on 
on specifically when it comes to a really good newsletter. So you want to make sure that you have a solid subject line. And that's, I mean, pretty straightforward. And that's uh, that that's applicable for any and all emails that you send. You always want to have a solid subject line. When it comes to the newsletter, depending on how catchy your subject line is, you may just want to reuse it and just kind of update it. For Lulalu, the customer story that we feature every month, it's called Lulalu Lady of the Month. And every time we send it out, our subject line is something along the variation of meet mm-hmm. our Lulalu Lady of the Month for September. And then you click on the email and then there she is. So you can kind of um, recycle those subject lines. But again, if you want to get super creative, get creative every month or every week that you send out a newsletter. Preview text is the next. um, And that just kind of follows in suit with your subject line. Just make sure it matches up. And preview text, I'm not super partial to me personally, but I know it is important. And it is that kind of like sneaky little line that you see under your subject line when you're looking at your inbox. So it's definitely important to include. The next thing is get personal with your copy. That's mm-hmm. an ingredient all like in and of itself that we'll talk about later in this episode. But you just want to make sure that you're personal. So if there's something that you mentioned in last month's l- newsletter, make sure that you mention it again. Or if you've managed to segment your newsletters really, really well, make sure that you are directly addressing the audience that you are sending that email to. There are other ways to get personal. But again, we'll touch on that a little more uh, later on in the episode. You also want to avoid words that normal people don't know. So uh, it's one thing if you sell a water bottle bottle, but now you're talking about its spout and all these things and all the all the materials that go into creating the water bottle, but you're going to lose your audience because they don't work for your brand and they don't make your water bottle. So mm-hmm. use words that everybody knows so you don't lose them. The uh, excessive jargon isn't really impressive. It's more annoying than anything for subscribers. <laughs> um, make sure that you keep your copy short and sweet. Anything that's super long winded, it just eventually becomes irrelevant and you lose interest of your customers, which is not what you want. You want to make sure that your newsletter is relevant. So if you're selling water bottles, you don't want to be talking about, gosh, uh, soy candles, you know, unless you find some wacky way to relate the two, you don't want to uh, just include random information for the sake of random information. I'm sure that you guys can all guess what's on my on my desk as I'm recording. This is a water bottle and a soy candle. And then the last point for copy is simple and effective call to action. So Mm -hmm. You always want to include a call to action, uh, some kind of CTA button in your email, but you want to keep it short, sweet, and to the point. Whether it's like grab this playlist or check out our favorite water sources or whatever it is, something that's relating to an aspect of the newsletter. I don't love the idea of calling to action for your customers to go directly to your website because then it's just kind of an awkward push to sell. You want to call them to action for something that's valuable and relevant to the newsletter and that's going to kind of divert their attention from like, oh, this is a brand that's just trying to sell me a product and they're going to engage with you because you've provided some kind of resource for them. Okay, so that's copy. For design kind of the same thing, but a little different. So first thing is you want to make sure that whatever it is that you create is good on desktop and mobile. If it looks amazing on desktop, and then the second you open that email, it looks like a disaster on mobile, don't even bother sending it. As we mentioned in our very first episode of this podcast, most people are opening on mobile. And so you want to make sure that you're catering completely to that demographic, if not only catering to that demographic, like if it looks phenomenal on mobile and it looks okay on desktop, you could probably get away with it. But for it to look phenomenal on desktop and it just looks like a disaster on mobile, it's just not worth it. So make sure that you're checking both and how your email renders on both. Make sure that your design stays on brand. So whether that's color, scheme, thematically, the fonts that you use, etc. You want to make sure that your newsletter looks like something that came fresh off your website or fresh out of your store. Creating these newsletters that they look like they came from a random different company. It's just it doesn't it doesn't sit well with your subscribers and you lose that connection of like, wait a second, I thought they looked like this. Are they changing? What is this? Like, you know, it just it creates confusion. Friendly fonts are your friends. It is so cool. (laughs) It's so cool when you have brands that create uh, all 
all these incredible fonts and they're super special and you can't find them anywhere and they're completely designer generated. But I can promise you that if you include them in your email, they are just going to look like Arial or Times New Roman when someone gets mm-hmm, it. So mm-hmm. make sure that you choose fonts that are accessible by most browsers and accessible with most uh, email platforms. So that way you're not completely destroying the look and feel of your email because that stinks. I've seen that happen all too many times. And what could have been a really phenomenal newsletter just looks like a cheesy document that a third grader wrote up for a school presentation. You know, no, no offense that to makes, third graders. That makes sense. Yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. All so my papers, yeah. it makes sense, even back in like grade 11. Yeah, it was me too. Me too. (laughs) Okay, the next one. Does this picture say a thousand words? Images are awesome in emails. And um, actually for one of my clients, we only use uh, image-based emails to send out for campaigns specifically. I would not recommend it. We have a really solid uh, Clavio expert team who uh, quite bluntly like checks the heck out of that email before it goes out to make sure that it the deliverability isn't affected to make sure that there's no spamming involved. Like it's a solid email. So that's the only reason why I feel comfortable sending out a completely image-based email. You want to make sure that you're not including images for the sake of including them. Like don't put them in if it's not necessary or if it takes away from the content that you're trying to create or that you're trying to provide to your audience. So Mm -hmm. just be really, really particular about the images that you select, where they go, and if you actually need them or not. Because if they're just, again, taking away from the content no point just get rid of it it's trash again keep it short and sweet so I know we mentioned this in copy but for design if there are larger blurbs of copy that just are valuable and relevant you need to include typically what we recommend is for designers to not leave these huge chunks of text because it looks really overwhelming for a reader, but split it up, put some text on an image, you know, kind of find a creative way to include all of the text without it being overwhelming or looking too busy. You also want to make your emails busy subscriber friendly. What this means is when they look at the email, you want them to have the ability to read in and sit down and spend a few minutes actually reading all the content in your email and your newsletter, or you want to give them the ability to just scan through, pick out the information that they want, and then keep moving with their day. HTML HTML versus plain text, you want a combo of both always. You want your HTML emails to be able to render nicely in plain text, but you definitely don't want to just send out plain text emails because those are boring. (laughs) Mm -hmm. You want an attractive CTA, so along with it being simple and effective, a simple and effective call to action, you want your CTA button to look attractive and you want it to uh, be kind of clickable, you know, like, oh, wow, I want to click on this. This looks cool. And then the last one is testing, testing, one, two, three. You need to test all your emails and make sure that everything is working well because nothing is worse than when you send out a newsletter, you can't click on your links, the images aren't loading, you have broken images, the font looks terrible. I mean, there's so many things that can go wrong with the design of an email and it just ruins your email. Quite frankly, you'll lose subscribers over it. So make sure that you test all your emails multiple times before you go ahead and send them out, especially your newsletters because those are uh, your big kind of uh, connecting, engaging points for your subscribers. So that is number three, great copy and even better design. And we will definitely be creating more episodes around uh, detailed information for copy and then detailed information for email design. So, okay, Vera, hit us with number four, because this one is a killer for me, but it's so important. So uh, I need to hear it. (laughs) Number four. So uh, basically you've created this amazing, beautifully looking, uh, well-written newsletter. What's the next step? Who should you send your email to? So probably the biggest mistake that every business can make is to be sending emails like to your entire list, to your entire database. And we've talked about it in our previous episodes a lot, uh, but we will not stop talking about it because this is a big one. Out of 100 marketers, probably 89 are making this same mistake. And honestly, this mistake is giving email marketing a bad name. So newsletters is not exception. Please do not send an email newsletter to your entire, entire list. Just, just like don't. What do you think happens when a person is getting an email that is 
not exactly relevant to them. So here are some interesting numbers. So 60% will just delete an email. And that's a that's not a bad thing, right? Okay, they deleted the email, they didn't read it. Oh, well. Worse, when they will unsubscribe from you. So uh, 27% will unsubscribe from the brand completely and like around 23% will mark your emails as a spam. And that's like the... Miserable. The, 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 the big and bad thing that can happen to you. So this good old spray and pray approach um, <laughs> it will not it will not work with newsletters so segmenting is probably the biggest thing that you can do with your list so the very least that you can do to be sending your email to your engaged segment for the most of our clients we define engaged segment as people who open at least one email from you within the last 90 days or 60 days so obviously the number of days it will depend on what industry you are working with so this definition of the segment will be different for each and every brand i know Alyssa, that you were working with uh, some kind of farmers brand or mm-hmm. or like the seeds or something so yep. probably for them this like engaged segment would maybe be like longer mm-hmm. because their sales pretty much happen like once a year yeah They're like correct me if i'm wrong but i mean so you basically need to understand what's your like cycle of your client mm-hmm. but generally speaking like 60 to 90 days it's something that we recommend so a bit more advanced scenario is to be sending like different newsletter to different kind of customers or segmenting your list based on interest. Say if you are selling like sport gear, if I'm doing yoga, I will not be interested in boxing gloves. So um, (laughs) what you can do, I mean, you might be interested, but the chances are really low. So uh, what you can do and what we've been doing for our clients, we basically create this email preference page Mm. where the client can go, the, the customer can go and actually like pick what they want to receive from you. They can say, hey, only send me the ballet lessons promotion or only send me the newsletters related to boxing and stuff like that. So Mm -hmm. this is a bit more advanced strategy, but believe me, this works. So again, the very least that you can do is to be sending your emails to the engaged and you can also segment it based on the product they've purchased in the past, based on the interest, based on how often they purchase from you and stuff like that. So this was your number four. So number four, segment your list properly. So tip number five, Alyssa. Make it personal. Yeah, yeah, it's a big one. You already mentioned it briefly, but let's yeah. let's talk about it. Cause yeah, 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 yeah. And it's great because it, doing the segmenting is, um, it's a good segue into the personalization because segmenting mm-hmm. is actually a way that you can personalize, but there are other methods. So as email marketers, we already know that personalization can be very, very helpful and can lead to huge successful emails. So here are a couple of statistics that actually I was pretty impressed with. So emails with personalized subject lines are 26% more likely to be opened. Marketers have found a 760% increase in email revenue from segmented campaigns, that's which insane. is like, <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a serious number. 760% increase in email revenue just from segmenting your campaigns nuts Uh, so it's very obvious to us that personalizing emails is beneficial but there are still email marketers that are making these mistakes of not doing that and they're really struggling to find ways to personalize their campaigns and more specifically their newsletters for example during the holiday season only 80% of marketers or 80% of marketers place promotions within their top three email marketing strategies, but only 56% of marketers listed segmentation-based targeting as a top tactic and only 21% were leveraging real-time personalization or A-B testing, according to Media Post. That is crazy to me because the holidays, where tomorrow is the first day of September, we're already gearing up at Floium. Like, oh, oh my yeah. gosh, like we're starting to get like a very low level of anxiety, but it will increase very soon because we know what's <laughs> coming. Yeah. <laughs> the fact that the people don't think about personalization coming. is like, yeah, yeah, holidays are coming, winter's coming. So the fact that marketers aren't thinking about personalization in the time that it matters most and can have the greatest impact is huge. It's definitely something that we need to focus on more as email marketers. A lot of marketers do want to personalize, 
but they don't believe that they have the tools to do so. So they don't really know how to segment their database, integrate personalization into their strategy, and really how to just use it to drive more successful email marketing campaigns. So as Vera had mentioned with segmenting, that is a huge way to personalize your emails because now you're you're basically creating these lists and these segments of people who want to know more about specific bits of information that you're sending out. So you could effectively create five different newsletters depending on the interest that you cater to. And based on the segments that you create, you can send out a newsletter to segment one, a newsletter to two, three, four, five, and so on. And these newsletters, it's going to take you a little more time because you're creating multiple different versions of content. But ultimately, you're going to make your subscribers happier because they're like, whoa, I'm getting an email about the exact thing that I asked for information about. So it's huge. And the personalized newsletters, they're really primarily centered on customer segmentation, which is what we did focus on earlier. So if you want to dig further into the minds of your customers, you need to know more about them than just their age, gender, and job. So ultimately, what you have to start doing is going beyond surface level information when you collect data from your customers. You have to find ways to ask them about their hobbies, their food choices, personal life, or track their habits. Did they just have a baby? Are they pregnant? How often do they use a particular app? There are so many different things that you can do to create targeted emails and further your, further your segmentation. So ultimately, it's just all about finding as much information as you can as possible about your customers, about your subscribers and then finding ways to send relevant information to them that has to do with exactly what they're going through in their life. And um, there are flows and different automations and things like that that you can put in place to slowly gain the trust of your subscribers so they want to give you more information about their lives. The personalization thing, I mean, it links directly to the relevance, which is Mm -hmm. uh, what we're completely obsessed Mm -hmm. with. So um, it's just a case of making sure that you're focusing on that and, and really pressing hard to get as much as possible. So we have our last special ingredient for this recipe for perfect newsletters vera number six number six is encourage communication and request feedback and that's a list interesting that you actually mentioned about like finding the ways to ask your customers about their hobbies food choices mm-hmm. like life and stuff like that because i do think it's super super important so our secret ingredient number six is to find the ways to get the feedback so encourage communication and request feedback so here's the good like example that i found somewhere on on the internet so you wouldn't walk to someone's home with like a megaphone and start blasting so don't do this with your newsletters don't do this with your customers inboxes instead of like blasting orders try to start a conversation let your customer talk to you let your customers respond to your emails ask the questions find out as much information about their favorite I don't know like food and hobbies and um, about their favorite apps and stuff like that. So let your customers do the work for you. So how to do that? Well, you can do as little as like adding a little like a sentence at the end of each and every newsletter saying something like, hey, we hope you found something useful in our newsletter. So don't be shy. Let us know like what you enjoyed and what you didn't enjoy. Like what was your favorite part of the email? You would be surprised how many actually good quality response you will get. So this is like the easiest and the minimum that you can do. Not only will your subscribers feel as you as if you were speaking direct, directly to them, but their feedback will be like super, super invaluable to your business. Another thing, and I think you've done it, Alyssa, numerous times uh, with your clients and I've done it with mine. So you can also ask your customers to fill out a quick survey. So we are regularly like sending different surveys about like the products, about the quality of the emails that we are sending and stuff like that. So we are like basically collecting this information piece by piece to make this beautiful portrait of who are we sending this emails to. So think of the emails as the best tool to communicate and hold all the attention of your customers in a distraction-free environment. So basically, this is the place when you can talk to your clients and when you can actually like hear back from them. So encourage communication, request feedback. And believe me, this is very, very important and you will be happy with the results. So here you have them, like six essential tips for writing a perfect, perfect newsletter. So let's just quickly go over them once again, just so you remember what are they. So Alyssa, what what was the first one? So number one is to start with your goal in mind. Number two was give readers what they need 
and what they didn't know they needed. <laughs> <laughs> number three is great copy and even better design. Number four, segment your list properly because as we already know, this is huge. <laughs> that's the, this that's is the huge. biggest one for us. Probably, probably. <laughs> the number five, make it personal. And the last one is encourage communication and request feedback. Love it. I think yeah. this is a, a pretty good recipe. Maybe we should pretty, try and... Uh, pretty, pretty solid recipe. <laughs> yeah, yeah, seriously. Okay, guys. Well, don't forget to subscribe and share this podcast with your friends. If you do have any questions at all that you'd like us to feature on our podcast episodes, make sure that you send them in at flowium.com slash ask. If you want to get involved in a community of other like-minded email marketers, that's very engaging. People ask questions, people answer, everyone's uh, in touch all the time. Join us at flowium.com slash community. As a note, all the resources that we used to create today's podcast episode can be found on our website at flowium.com slash podcast under each episode's page. This week was episode number nine, six essential tips for writing the perfect newsletter. If you're new to Clavio or wanting to try any of the suggestions out for yourself, this can be a super helpful resource, but we do also offer a course where we cover everything you need to master Clavio. And you can access this course by visiting the products page of our Flowium website. And finally, if you're interested in getting some more advice on how to establish a solid email marketing strategy, do make sure that you visit flowium.com slash contact and sign up for a free consultation will basically be able to kind of give you an overview of what you're doing for your e-commerce store and any recommendations that we have for you. Yeah. And next week, guys, we will be discussing um, all the things copy. So uh, we've covered it briefly in our episode today, but we are actually mm-hmm. working with our rockstar team of copywriters and they are helping us with the research. So next mm-hmm. time uh, we will be talking about the best practices and secrets um, to copywriting and we will be sharing them with you. So don't miss it. Uh, we'll provide a lot of cool resources as always. So stay tuned. Invite your friends. Invite <laughs> your grandma. How many times did I mention grandma in this podcast? <laughs> a lot. We should play this uh, game, you know, with a shot. <laughs> Every time someone <laughs> mentions grandma. So stay tuned, you guys. It's going to be fun. And thank you so much for listening. We're happy to have you here. Thank you guys so much. And we will see you next week. Take care. See you next week. Bye. Thanks for listening to Email Einstein. Can you feel that? Your marketing brain just got a little bit bigger. We ask that you please use it wisely. You've got all the theory you need to get out there and start boosting your sales because great emails equals revenue squared.